welcome everyone to the afternoon session of conference uh, where we're going to be looking at problem, machine learning problems in, in the biological and biomedical fields. And we're going to start with our keynote speaker, Ziv Bar Yosef. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the head of the Systems Biology Group at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. He is a joint professor in the machine learning department and at the Lane Center for Computational Biology. Um, Ziv got his PhD uh, in computer science at MIT, working with David Clifford, David Gifford, and uh, Tommy Yakola on problems of interactions and networks uh, in high throughput biological data, which is what he will be telling us about. And the, uh, he is this year's recipient of the Overton Award for his work in, in machine learning, uh, in the application of machine learning to problems in biology. So, looking forward to your talk. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for inviting me. So keeping with the theme of this meeting, I'll uh, talk about some issues related to dynamics and temporal uh, analysis of biological networks. But because this is uh, basically the only session devoted to biology and health, I wanted to give a slightly broader overview of the machine learning challenges that we are facing. Um, and many of these arise because of the large increase in, in the amount of data that we can measure, really leading to explosion of data, at least when you look at it historically from biology, I'm not sure it matches the data that Facebook and Google collect, but these are large data sets for biologists, which require new thinking and new machine learning uh, and direction. So, you know, everybody hopefully is familiar with the self algorithm of molecular biology, but the important thing is that we can now measure a lot of the uh, players and a lot of the activity within this with new technology. So, for example, sequencing, um, many of you have heard about next generation sequencing, can be used to measure DNA, it can also be used to measure uh, other things, including uh, mRNAs, and also it can be used to measure interactions, something called chip-seq experiments. Um, we can measure mRNAs using microarrays, and this has been used actually quite a lot in the machine learning community uh, for a long time now. They are actually almost uh, dead. Um, we are now transitioning to sequencing events. It doesn't mean that the data we collected is not useful, but uh, in a few years, I think microarrays will be a, a thing of the past. Uh, but we can also measure other things. We can measure interactions. And these lead to networks, and interactions include how proteins interact, how they work together in the cell. And nothing in the cell usually happens by one protein, even though a lot of the drugs target one protein. Eventually, it's a big cascade of things. And it involves a lot of interactions between protein. And protein turns on and off by uh, interactions. Um, I wanted to mention a few. So I'll talk about a few uh, machine learning issues that we'd like to address. Before that, I want to mention a few other things that we haven't worked on, but, are, but other people are working on in the context of machine learning, just to show you the wide range of topics that are covered. Uh, an example is, of course, classification. We heard about it uh, earlier today, and I'm sure in other days of this uh, workshop. Uh, so classification uh, is now used in the context of microarrays, for example, and this has led to uh, actually FDA approved uh, methods for uh, combining uh, information from different genes. And just, I mean, it's hard for us to think that this is a major issue because 70 features in a classifier doesn't seem like a huge deal. But if you look at how biology and health operated until a few years ago, this was unheard of. All the biological markers are one protein, maybe two. Going from one or two to 70 required a huge change in thinking and, and because Right, biologists really like to understand why this is a marker. And for these 70, it's not clear why they work well, but they do work well. And this was approved. It was actually a major breakthrough. And again, the algorithm itself is proprietary, although prior publications indicated that it's probably based on some version of support vector machine. So this is an application of classification. Active learning is being used and suggested as a method for performing biological experiments rather than you know, the standard scientific approach where you come up with an hypothesis, you do an experiment, you revise your model, and so forth. People say, let's automate this. And one way to automate this is with active learning. And, and researchers are building these robots. This is actually from a few years ago. And other people have carried on in, in trying to automate uh, biological experimentation using active learning methods. Um, this actually does not have anything to do with machine learning, but I can't skip marathons there. Uh, something I'm very interested in, but just another application of uh, computational biology that I'm personally very interested in, but spends a, long, a large range of topics. Anyway, but that's a, a 
applications that other people have done, I want to move on to a, some work that we did and discuss three specific topics that we looked at and that we have used machine learning methods uh, to try and address uh, biological problems. The first uh, area is this idea of error correction in sequencing experiments. So what are sequencing experiments? Before, before that, um, so sequencing data, some of you heard the term next generation sequencing. Turns out that the data we can spit out of a sequencer machine. So sequencing machine takes your uh, sample, blood samples, or they can take other samples, and spit out a collection of relatively short reads. Each of these reads is between 50 and 100 bases, right now at least. And together, but, but the collection is huge, it's uh, hundreds of millions of those, and together, this cover your entire DNA, or they can cover also your entire transcriptome. Transcriptome are the set of proteins that are present in each cell, and these are different for different individuals. They may be different uh, day and night, they are different between different cells in our body, and so forth, whereas DNA is pretty fixed. So these uh, technologies uh, have been developing very rapidly over the last few years. Just uh, uh, to compare this to um, what happened uh, uh, 10 years ago, so the, the human genome sequencing project was, a, a, or at least one of the efforts was a publicly funded project that took more than a decade, cost billions of dollars, and led to basically sequencing of three billion letters. This can be done today in maybe a few days for less than $10,000. And the rate at which this was uh, uh, increasing is faster than Moore's law. So the rate in which DNA is generated, or not generated, but the rate in which our ability to generate DNA is increasing is faster than Moore's law. So this is the rate of what's known as next generation sequencing. Uh, this is the rate of uh, uh, hard disk storage, with, which is 14 months, and this is more or less Moore's law. This is uh, 19 months. So you can see that we get this huge growth in this amount of data, and, and it's not you know, this is, it's going to happen pretty soon that almost everybody will have their DNA sequence uh, when they are born and then maybe multiple times during their life to identify different events. So this will become, right now, it's still mostly academic research, but it's going to become a consumer uh, uh, technology pretty soon, actually. Okay, so, so this is the uh, uh, DNA sequencing. Um, just to give you some illustration of the numbers we are talking about here. So um, this is actually not the newest technology. We have recently done some experiments, and on our experiments, uh, so this is the length of the reads that I mentioned. This is the length of the reads. This goes up to 50. Nowadays, you can get to 75, 100. The number of reads you get is pretty high. Uh, you can see that it's um, hundreds of millions of reads, each of them of length 50. So overall, you get uh, uh, billions of uh, bases. And this is just one experiment. Uh, if you think about it, uh, lots of experiments of different individuals and you have to store all of this raw data, one of the <coughs> major problems now of sequencing center is that they're running out of storage space. And it's not entirely clear actually, that's, I guess I'm not going to talk about this now, but the issue of compression of this data is actually a pretty problematic issue because you want, it's not clear if you want to have a lossy compression and then you can't really go back or you want to have a loss. Left. Anyway, there's a lot of challenges there as well. But we are running, or they are running out of space. Space becomes now more expensive than the machines themselves to do the sequencing. Okay, so this is a next generation sequencing. Um, if we thought that the rate was amazing, this company, um, it's a company based in the UK, they claim that they will short, soon ship this machine here, which you can see is a USB uh, like machine, and this will sequence an entire DNA of an individual. Uh, within a few hours, basically in, on, on your hand. Where does the DNA go in? So, I mean, <laughs> no, it does go in. Here, here is the DNA. You, you just, so DNA is basically, you need really a blood one. You don't need too much. And the interesting thing, okay, so this is a prototype. It's like uh, <laughs> these car shows where they show you a prototype of car, there's nothing in. Uh, that's, <laughs> and it's true. There's not, I mean, but they claim they can do it. There were actually a few papers published just two weeks ago <laughs> in, in Asia on this. So, so there were people questioning whether they can do it or not. The technology works, whether you can really, so this is a different technology than other technologies. That's why they claim they can actually move, they claim they can move now to 20,000 bases. 20,000 bases per each, rather than a few hundred. 
So the technology works, whether or not uh, they can actually get this commercialized. It's a different issue. But just again, the, 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 the reason I mentioned this is that this is coming. I mean, the, the, this, this explosion of data is coming. And one thing that, uh, even though the technology increases, one thing that is pretty stable, I would say, over the last few years is the fact that we still have errors in these reads. So you get these 50 base pairs that, sh that are basically random. So you take the DNA, this is what you do. You take the DNA, you cut it down to pieces randomly, and then you sequence each of these pieces. Each of them is 50 or 100 or maybe even longer, and the goal is to put them together, assemble them. By right? using some graph, you can, uh, there are actually pretty interesting methods for doing that. Um, now, if the DNA that we recovered was completely accurate, this would actually not be too hard. Because if you have some pretty long overlapping, if you have a 75 mer and you can find an overlapping 75 mer that has 50 base pairs overlap, it's very likely it's, you, know, you can compute the probability. But the probability that they come from different regions is very small. So you can put them together. Unfortunately, these have errors. So reading the, each of these reads is going to have errors. And people compute it, there are different ways of computing it. The current assumption is that it's around 4%. Now, that might not sound a lot, because we get billions of reads. But if you have errors in even one of these reads, it's very hard to completely, or at least initially, locate it within the other reads. And then what happens is this complicates greatly the downstream analysis. So you get all these reads, you want to put them together, but the errors make it look like there's no agreement, which, first of all, leads to huge uh, loops in your graph, and, and this is usually done by some uh, Hamiltonian graph search, and uh, deep Bruyne graphs, and, 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 and it's pretty uh, challenging basically to deal with, or basically the major challenge is, is these errors, okay? But people can actually uh, address this, or sometimes they can address it by, before even going to the assembly, if you have a reference genome, for example, humans have the genome sequence, you can just put the read on the genome and see if there is any uh, small errors, you correct that, and then you recover it, and then you put it together. But now, OK, so this is the problem. Uh, but, but now, so far, we talked about the genome sequencing. But as I said, you can also use this technology for something called RNA sequencing. So again, most of you are familiar with microarrays, which measure not the uh, uh, content. So DNA is basically a book, but it doesn't change over time and, uh, and across different conditions. RNA is a dynamic uh, uh, quantity. So it changes between day and night. It changes between different cells in your body. It changes when you are sick and not. And microarrays have been used to study that. You can also study that now with uh, what's known as uh, uh, RNA-seq or RNA sequencing. You basically take the RNA the same way you did it before. You shred it to the small pieces. You sequence each one of them. And then you try to put it together. There are some differences if you think about it. For example, the coverage is not uniform. DNA, when you do DNA sequencing, the coverage is uniform. You randomly select uh, pieces, and you just uh, sequence them. RNA, because it's proportional to the levels of genes, different genes can have very different proportions, and the coverage, of course, is not going to be uniform. That's a challenge. But one thing people do, and, and again, if you have errors, then it becomes even more challenging, especially for those that are expressed at low levels, which may be important. Because for those, you only have a few uh, measurements, and those, if those contain errors, it's very hard to put them together. But one thing that people can do is just map it to the genome. So you can map it back to the genome. And then if you know the genome in this case, you just say, OK, I had an error here, but it's clear that there's no way it can come from any other place but here. So it's an error. I'm changing it. So people have done that. And, and, and this works, actually. A lot of uh, experiments were done using this technology. Unfortunately, there is a large class of experiments that study organisms that do not have a genome. Or well, all of us, everybody has a genome. But they don't have a genome assembled. We don't know what the genome is. Putting the genome together, even though you can do this experiment, collect all the information, putting a genome together actually requires a lot of manual work. It can take a year, and it takes a lot of experts, because they have to agree on exactly uh, what is the uh, order of the gene, what are genes. There's a lot of work that goes into annotating and putting together a genome. So uh, the vast majority, basically, 100%, right? The number, the number of sequences that have genomes assembled is a few hundred, right? So 100%, because if you think about the number of species we have, 100% of the species, basically, almost 100%, do not have the genome assembled. And sometimes it's actually very interesting to study those 
a species that do not have a genome assembled. For example, sometimes people want to look at how different traits have evolved across some time, and you can collect a lot of rel relatively close species, but trying to assemble the genomes is very uh, hard to, for all of them. You can collect hundreds of those in some tree, but if we can actually, instead of really assembling the genome, maybe we can just assemble the von Skeptome, look at the expression of genes, then first of all, we have a much smaller population to worry about, and sometimes it's much easier to reason about it. So dealing with this RNA-seq data, even if you don't have a genome, is a problem that people are facing, and now the question becomes, how do you correct errors in this case? So this is actually a machine learning challenge. You don't have a reference. You have a lot of information, and you know you have errors. How do you correct these errors? And we came up with, a, yeah, so there are a few caveats. I don't want to go into this. I said non-uniform coverage or something called alternative splicing, no reference genome, those are the challenges. So how do you correct these errors? And it turns out that machine learning actually can play a role in correcting these uh, errors, even though the data is very large. Uh, and we developed a, what we call Seeker, which is an HMM-based approach. And when I say an HMM-based approach, we are actually building um, close to a million HMMs here for this error correction. So what's the idea? The idea is to do some read hashing so that we can very quickly get to those. As I said, we have hundreds of millions of those. Then we generate a, what we call contigs. We generate HMMs that represent not one read, but a collection of reads. And we use that to do the read correction. This is before the assembly. So we're not trying to, or we don't care if we uh, find the entire transcript, the entire length of this gene, the only thing we care about is that we have in a long enough uh, reconstructed what we call contig or a subset that we can use for error correction. So let me show you uh, how we do it. So the first thing is um, you have to do this hashing, and usually people done, and there are some very interesting work that people have done to speed this up, and the idea is that um, you basically uh, put these uh, uh, reads in a hash table, uh, by linking it to some k mil counts uh, number. So basically, you select k, which is a number that usually is around 20. Um, and the reason why you do 20 is, if you think about it, there are four possible bases of RNA or DNA. And 4 to the power of 20, is a, it's, it's very unlikely to see multiple occurrences of this k mil in the genome. So 20, any number around it, usually works pretty well. And you hash it using this uh, k count in some, and people have actually developed some nice sophisticated methods for doing that, so that you can retrieve it very fast uh, when you need it. Okay, so this is the uh, initial organization, but here comes the uh, H HMM part. You take one read, you use it as a seed, then based on that you retrieve all other reads that have an overlap, a K-mail overlap with that, uh, and, and you choose some K with this read that you recovered. Now, some of them are really related to that uh, to that seed, but some can come from other, uh, other parts of the uh, trans transcriptome, so they, not all of the ones that match this K, even if you use the good K, there are some biological reasons why some of them will not belong to the same part of the gene, so you do some clustering to identify which ones belong and which not, and then using the subset that is coherent, you build an HMM. So you have a good starting point for the HMM, but still, we need to build a million of those. So you need to do a pretty, uh, so first of all, of course, we can use some heuristics. In this case, we build the initial HMM based on the k mil alignment rather than on actual uh, uh, right, uh, backward-forward algorithm. Uh, but even after that, you want to extend it, usually and we extend it by taking more reads because the, the first HMM is usually only 30 or 40 bases, which are in this agreement between the reads that you took from the hash table. And then you want to extend it to hundreds of bases usually. So you take things that overlap with the uh, edges of these HMMs and you extend it and so forth. The question is how to extend it and there you have to use some, uh, and again I'm not uh, going to, into the computational details, but you have to use some heuristics or you have to restrict your transition probabilities so that you can actually extend these HMMs in a reasonable time. Once you extend these HMMs, once you have these HMMs, um, basically you retrieve the consensus sequence from the HMM, and these HMMs are called profile HMMs. They have one long sequence in the middle, and then you have the ability to have uh, insertions and deletions, so you have the ability to transition to states that have slightly different uh, configuration, or to, or to states that are missing because of some events that can happen. 
And using these HMMs, basically, you now align back the reads to the HMM, find places that, where you have disagreement, and correct those. Okay, so this is the basic idea. Again, the, the more computational, so the HMM technology, oh, HMMs have been around for a long time. The challenge here is to do it fast enough, though, that you can fit a million HMM learning procedures within a few hours, even if you use a cluster. Right? So this is um, a, more, a, a more like a graphical overview. We start with, uh, we start with um, a pool of reads. We select one as the seed. From the seed, we find all those that match. In this case, they match this KML. We do some cluster analysis. We throw away the, those that don't agree with the majority of the uh, genes, or of the reads that we have. And then we build an HMM. We start with the middle HMM, which is based on this alignment. And then we extend it to the left and to the right. You can see that the HMM has a very specific st uh, structure. It has a match state. This is the uh, uh, consensus of the reads. But then also it has an insertion state where some reads can have, uh, by, uh, because of errors, can have uh, letters inserted into them even though they don't really appear. And we have a deletion space, again, the opposite. And you now have this structure, but you can see that the transition is fairly limited. You can only transition to very few states from a specific state, so this constrains the learning procedure. And once you build this HMM, you stop, there is some stopping criteria, and then you basically find the consensus, which is basically the most likely emission from the max state, and you use the alignment to correct the reads based on that. So this is a, a process that we uh, have used, and, and you can basically test it and compare it, and people have developed error correction. Error correction is an important problem for all of the next generation sequencing methods, and people have developed error correction, but most of them, actually almost all of them until now, were for DNA error correction. But now we are moving to RNA, and they don't work very well when faced with RNA, and uh, if, you're, um, if you're using human data, right, I mentioned that this is primarily for what we know, what's known as the novel sequencing, sequencing when you don't have the genome, but like any machine learning method, you first want to use it to test ground proof, and in this case, the ground truth was the human genome. So we have human genome. We can actually test it on human genome. And you can see that there are some, this is our method, Seeker. These are some other methods that either just say that if you have disagreement between two reads, I'm throwing away one of the reads. And then you get basically a 65% reduction from what you can get without any correction. So sometimes corrections are working against you. And in this case, we get 25% increase in the full length in assemblies. And so basically, genes that we can reconstruct for f to full length after the correction compared to without the correction. So that's not bad. You get a, a large increase in the amount of data that you have. But the more interesting, I think, part is actually applying this to uh, data that uh, we didn't have a genome for. And we, co we are collaborating with a group in our university that is studying development. And they are studying it in some pretty weird organisms. One of them is called a uh, sea cucumber. I don't know if anybody have seen or ate sea cucumbers. They are pretty weird creatures. Uh, they don't move around too much, uh, but they are living. All, they are not. <laughs> they are really living. Like yeah, organisms are not cucumbers. Uh, anyway, sea uh, cucumber has a relative that is called sea urchin, which has been used as a model for development for many years actually, and it's a very important species. So we have the sequence for sea urchin, but we don't have the sequence for sea cucumber and several of its relatives, even though it can actually help us know something about the. Uh, development of these thick regions. So we took this, we extracted the uh, RNA data from it in two time points. We wanted to see how it develops. And then we just ran our algorithm and the assembly on that. And then we compared what we found to the genes that were known already for the sea orchard. And it turns out, and again, uh, this, what this tells you is that um, almost 50% of the genes we could uh, extract from this had matches in this close relative. But almost 60% didn't have. And this is interesting. Some people are very interested in new genes. They may confer some uh, activity that we are not aware of, maybe some things that people are interested in, 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 in applying to biotechnology related to energy and so forth. So we had some genes that didn't have a match. Actually, this is 50% that didn't match the relative. But nowadays, we have these databases of genes that have been sequenced from all the different organisms. And we can ask, you know, how many of the genes in C. Orchin do not have a relative in any known a, a organism, or in, at least the ones that we have data for, and it turns out that there's quite a few of those that are unique to co chain, and you can find them even without the genome by doing this uh, RNA-seq assembly, and then you run some experiments to test whether or not our prediction are correct, 
this is something called the PCR experiment, and it doesn't matter exactly what, what, it, what it is, but the important thing is that you have four, seven, so these are seven genes that had relatives in other species, and these are seven genes that did not have, and all of these were conferred, which means that the correction and assembly were correct, and we found new genes, but none of oh, these were not known before. Nobody had seen this type of gene before. So this is actually nice because it opens the door to new sequencing experiments without the reference genome, and sometimes this can be beneficial. Okay, let me move to, uh, so this is uh, next generation, and again, there's lots of problems in next generation sequencing data just because of the quantity related to machine learning. And let me tell you a bit about some other uh, types of problems which are related to cross-species analysis. And again, this is the in increase in the size. Now, this is not sequencing database. This is a microarray, but again, this will be replaced by RNA seq but still it's the same. This is the, the increase, and you can see an almost exponential increase in the size of the expression databases that are out there. And this is actually the number. This is for different uh, uh, years. This is a public database called the Genome uh, Geo, uh, which is uh, supported by the NIH. Um, the, the species are growing, so we have humans that has something like uh, a few hundred thousands. This is mouse, rat, yeast, plant, and so forth. So we have these huge databases. They have hundreds of thousands of experiments that people have performed. And you would imagine, and, and, and each of these experiments, of course, is, is megabytes, sometimes gigabytes of data. So you would imagine that people would actually treat this as a treasure trove and will try to mine it. But it turns out that it's not very easy to compare these things across species. Even though all drugs basically are developed by studying mice or even simpler organisms and then applying it to human, there's actually no no good ways, or there aren't enough at least good ways, to compare, not sequence data, so we know how to compare the DNA letters, but to compare these, what I call functional data, these data of things that can change over time, interactions, and so forth across species. So this is a big challenge that we are facing now with the increase in data. So we have a lot of data, but it's very hard to compare it across species. There are a number of different reasons why this is true. Um, one of the reasons, this is from some study that we did uh, a few years ago, one of the reasons is that uh, these are some networks in different species. Uh, that one of them is yeast, they warm, flies. It doesn't exactly matter what they are. But the problem is you can see the same protein in the different species. So this, we, are, we try to put the same proteins in the different species. But they, even, and, and most of them do basically the same thing in the different species. But the interactions between them change quite a lot. So somehow, these species were able to maintain pretty much a coherent execution, even though the networks have changed between them. And this is something that, I guess, either is related or resembles things that we see in social sciences. But um, the question, of course, is how do we use that information in order to say, OK, this drug, even though it works on mice, it will not work on human. Because the protein that it targets is completely changed in human in terms of its neighbors, in terms of its function within the network. So this is a, a question that uh, we need to answer. Just to illustrate one example of how this question can play a very important role and how basically more, uh, I don't want to say correct, but definitely more detailed and careful analysis can have a very different outcome compared to the initial analysis. Let me talk about something called cell cycle expression data. So cell cycle is the process in which cells divide. We all start with a single, basically two cells. And now we are composed of trillions of cells, so we all got there by cell division. But cell cycle also plays a very important role in cancer. And people have been looking at it for a long time. A lot of the major components are components that drive cancer, because one of the major problems in cancer is that cancer cells continuously divide. So people have looked at the cell cycle using microarrays for many years now, almost a decade, starting with budding yeast, and bacteria, plants, human, mouse, and so forth. But they never tried to compare it. So they did it for human. They said, OK, human is here. Here is bacteria. Here is yeast. But what about the agreement? All species basically have very similar cell cycle process. Cells divide in all species. They copy the DNA, and they do some other things. What about the similarities between them? So in 2004, a group in the UK and then some other groups have sequenced something called the fission yeast. So the yeast itself, this is budding yeast. Uh, this is, I think, what we use for beer. And this is what we use for, I think this we use for beer. Well, one of them is for beer, one is for bread. You can pick uh, <laughs> the one you want. Um, but so people have sequenced uh, 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 this one uh, very early on. And then six years later, they sequence this, and they try to compare the agreement between them. And again, this is not human and, and yeast. This is two yeasts. And uh, not very close, but 
still there is. And so what did they say? They claim that our comparison between the fission yeast and the body yeast revealed a surprisingly small core of set of genes. So a very small set were in the intersection of both. In fact, they didn't put it, this is from the abstract, the number was 5%. So 95% of the participants in this yeast cell cycle are different from that, and still it works pretty similar, and both work pretty well, as you can tell from, I guess, enjoying either beer or bread. Okay, so, and, and, and this has been uh, followed by other comparisons that found even less agreement between the data. On the other hand, this is another group, this is a group in the UK, this is a group in the US, that actually claims that it was a 36% overlap. So they said 5%, 36% is now actually very large, because in biology, with all the noise and so forth, 50% would be extremely large. So what's going on? They claim that there's almost no agreement, these guys claim that there's a pretty good agreement, who is right? Let's say. So it turns out the differences have to do with the way people analyze the data. How do people analyze these types of data? And why machine learning can actually be a useful tool for improving that? So this is what people do. They do these experiments. They take yeast or plants or cacks. They do these uh, uh, microarray experiments. They extract a list of genes from them that are changing between them. And then they compare the list between them. Now, these experiments usually use different technologies. And people use different uh, methods for correcting the data here with some people normalization. There is some way of, a, a, after you get the data, you have, because this is time series data, you have to somehow interpolate it, and then you have, you have to do the gene calling. Each one of them use different methods because the, the, the set of genes in each species is different, so you need some different parameters there. So you get a lot of problems related to the actual agreement, not just in the data, but also in the analysis of the data up to this point. So a few years ago, we proposed a different approach to that. And the approach is, instead of doing the analysis separately and then comparing the signatures, maybe we can combine the analysis with some method, and then after that, so we do the experiment, we do a combined analysis where one can help us figure out what's going on in the other, and then after that, we can extract the similarities and differences from the combined analysis. And one way to do it is with a, a method called Markov random fields, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and and in this case, we use Markov random fields, and it's an undirected particle model, to encode the relationship between four different species. So if you can think of these four as different species, you have edges connecting these species if the proteins in one species are, are the same or are something called autolog. Autolog is a protein that has a very similar sequence to a protein in another species. So you have these edges which represent protein similarity. And then you have these nodes, these yellow nodes, that represents the level of these genes within the experiment. And the idea is, or the, ch or the goal eventually, is to assign proteins in, one, in each of the species as either a cell cycle or not. Are they participating in the cell cycle or not? Actually, surprisingly, or not, um, almost 15, 10 to 15 percent of proteins in our body participate in the cell cycle, which means that it's an extremely important. Okay, so the, the idea is to try and actually assign, this is basically a classification, so we want to assign or a latent variable estimation problem, we want to assign 0 or 1 or a probability of 0 or 1 to each of these nodes, but we don't want to do it in isolation for each species. We want to do it so that one species influences the other. And of course, by doing that, you introduce some biases that you can actually control for that and show that these biases actually do not harm your analysis. And once we did it, we found the following uh, uh, results. So if you recall, uh, the claim was this is uh, the two yeasts, so VC and Pombek. The initial claim was that the overlap was 5%. We found a much larger uh, overlap of roughly 25, between 20 and 25%. You can also take it higher, and it turns out, I don't know if you believe it or not, but we share 5% of the cell cycle genes in our body with the uh, yeast. And um, right, and so basically, uh, so it depends on what level of cutoff you're using, but between 5 and 8% of the genes are actually cycling in all of the species we looked at, which contained, you know, tattoos and human, but also plant species. So it actually is a pretty conserved uh, uh, system. And now, once you have that, you can take it to the next level, and then, we, in this case, we studied cancer. And we asked, since we are, uh, so we did some experiments, basically, where we took uh, cancer cells, and we asked what's going on with their cell cycle. So cell cycle in cancer, of course, is different than cell cycle in healthy cells, that's why these cells of cancer, they lost control, basically, of the cell cycle. But now, once you know the common denominator from different species, you can hypothesize 
that this common set is very important, right? Because it's not only conserved in sequence, it's also conserved in function across all these species. And now you can ask what's going on with in cancer. So this is comparison of healthy cells to cancer cells. And the conclusion was that a lot of the changes that we find are actually related to these very, very small but significant set of genes that are conserved. So these are something like the core machinery of the cell cycle. And if you know that, you can start thinking of modeling and other types of methods. But the important thing, keys, or the important step here is to improve the methods in which we compare these data for species by, a, a, in this case, machine learning tools. So this is a, a, the cross-species analysis. And we actually, a, a, I guess, one, one of the important things and I'm, I, that's why I'm sometimes ambivalent about machine learning uh, methods. So, so we held, I, I, even today, I, I wasn't here yesterday, but even today we had some motivation for machine learning methods based on some computational biology applications. And, and over the years I've seen this in NEET and ICML, but the ability to impact, to make impact in this area in biology has a lot to do not just with the method you develop, but also with the way you apply it. Biologists are usually not going to implement your methods. So you need to really develop the tools as well as, the, uh, as well as the method. And in this case, we developed a tool to do this cross-species analysis. Uh, basically, it's a, basically a search engine, but the search engine across species and across conditions that you give it a set of experiments that you did and comes up with experiments that match your experiments in other species or in the same species. And anybody who's interested is more than welcome to give this advice. Right? OK, um, so now I'm moving to uh, the dynamic part or the, the temporal part of this network where I think machine learning uh, plays the most crucial role. And so networks in the cell are something that we are very interested in. As I said, nothing in the cell works on its own. Everything works uh, by interacting with other things. And one of the key questions that people are interested in is give me a model of how things work. For example, how does cancer progress? How does your immune response uh, uh, respond to some invading pathogens? Why do we see differences between how these systems respond to HIV, for example, versus flu, which we can tolerate very well, but HIV we cannot. So what's going on inside the cell once the, uh, once the uh, uh, infection actually uh, basically comes and, and infects the cell? So this is the question about modern systems. And there's a lot of progress in this. I mean, um, maybe this community doesn't read the, the, the major uh, 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 what I call scientific publication, in this case Science and Nature and a few other journals. And, but biologists are now starting to think of activities in the cell in terms of networks. And that's actually quite a big change from what it was even a year, 10 years ago. They used to work on very specific nodes, but on, on very specific proteins. Now they're thinking in terms of networks. And if you look at these journals and you open them, you see a lot of uh, a network a, a models. This is a network of how, how immune response uh, works and flu. This is a network of how worms develop. This is a network for cancer and so on. So all of these are nice. They are very re or related to how we think of networks. There are nodes usually representing proteins. There are edges that usually represent some sort of an interaction, either directed or undirected. But there's one thing that is missing from all these networks. And the thing that is missing is time. Biological networks are not stable. They are not uh, Oh, at least in these response cases, they are not in a steady state. They keep evolving or changing over time. And time is almost completely missing from the networks that people are uh, putting forward um, when studying this. And you can ask yourself why. And this is done by some of the leading uh, biologists, so it's not like they don't think that time is important. The problem that biologists have with introducing time to their models is data. And what do I mean by that? It turns out that most of the data biologists use is either inherently static or measured in a static way. What do I mean by inherently static? Our DNA is inherently static. If you get flu today, you know, within a week, hopefully, you'll get better because your immune system responded, attacked the virus, and, and somehow was able to uh, move, you know, it away. But your DNA doesn't change within this week. It doesn't change even over a year. Or it takes years for the DNA to change. A lot of information derived from the DNA, including something called motif information, which tells us who controls who, is also static. That doesn't change. But the responses do change. And some other measurements, including measurements of interaction, this is something called how protein-protein interaction, how protein interact. This is called something called chip-chip, which measures which protein turn on and off other proteins. 
This can be measured over time, but technically it's very, very hard to do. So almost all of the measurements we have, close to 100% are static. Microarrays that I mentioned, actually, are also, a lot of them are static. So they measure cancer, right? So they take a cancer patient, they profile them, but it's really just a sample, right? The cancer progressed over a long time, and you just see one sample. So this is the, the data that we have. It's not the only data, actually, that we have. We do have time series data. We do have time series data. And the time series data that we have is also usually microarray data. But microarray data taken at specific time points. So this is not stock trading data where you can have almost infinite resolution. We can only take, I don't know how many of you are willing to give your blood every few minutes. So we can only take it uh, within some ranges. But we do have temporal or, or longitudinal measurements of this. So all of the networks that I've shown you before actually use this data. But they still ended up with a static representation. And you can ask yourself why. Um, and the answer is that if you have inherently static data and time series data, the common denominator is static. Because you can assume independence between the time point and reduce your uh, data basically to some static collection of time points. And we asked basically a few years ago, can we do the other way around? Can we take the time series data and use it to elevate the static data. And we came up with some ideas of how to do it. Um, so the idea we had is to start with a clustering-like approach. So it's not completely clustering. But this is a time series expression experiment where some genes go up, some genes go down. You can have three clusters here. But these are not completely independent clusters. The first hour, all of these are together. Then there is a divergent point here. And then there is another divergent point here. Now this, you can put it in a cluster. But usually, if you have, this is temporal function. But you have a, if you have additional static information, for example, you know that all the purple ones are controlled by transcription factor A, all the green ones were controlled by transcription factor B and protein B, and the red ones by C and D, you can actually make predictions about when these static events actually influence the expression of the levels that you see. And specifically, you may be able to annotate the, the, this image by saying that A and B are turning these guys up after this hour, C and D are turning these guys up, but after two hours, B is down again, so the genes it control is not, so B is not active anymore, but A remains active. So this is the idea that we had. Look at the data, try to identify this a divergent event, annotate them with proteins, and then assign time to the proteins. Sounded like a good idea to us until we looked at the data. So this is uh, how gene expression data looks like. Uh, it's not unusual. This is the typical. It's pretty hard for us, was well, pretty hard to find divergent events. Uh, in this data, but of course, I'm only showing you the, uh, the temporal component. There is also a static component that I'm not showing. And it turns out that there is actually a very nice um, machine learning technique that can actually deal with this. And it's actually very appropriate. So the machine learning methods we use is another version of hidden Markov models. And this, everybody knows what hidden Markov model is. But this one, I'm not sure that everybody has seen. So instead of using the standard hidden Markov model, where you have the uh, hidden states and the emissions, we use an input output hidden Markov model, which was initially, uh, basically the difference is that you add another layer, which is the input layer to the HMN. Now the input layer, unlike the, uh, uh, the, hit, the hidden state and the emission, the input layer can be static. What the input layer does is it doesn't affect directly the emissions, but it affects transition probabilities. So if you think of an HMM initially as a transition probability matrix, in this case, we don't have a transition probability matrix, because if you are in a state, the probability of transitioning to another state depends not just on the state you're in, but also on some input parameters that you have. So basically, you replace the transition probability matrix in this case with, in this, we use the logistic regression classifier. So basically, each state is associated with the logistic regression classifier. The logistic regression features are stuck, they are not related to the state, but not all genes make it to all states. So if you make it to a state, there is some probability that you transition to one state and another probability that you'll position to another state. Now, in this model, unlike regular HMM, we also try to learn the states. We, uh, unlike, it's not that we know what are the states and we just want to learn the transition or emission probabilities. In this case, we also want to learn the states and, the, uh, and learn the parameters and so on. So basically, the, uh, the, the, light, the log likelihood, basically, full likelihood, changes from just transition probability based on the state to transition probability based on the state and the input set, which is encoded in our case using a logistic regression, or L1, basically, or in a solid logistic regression classifier, so that you get a few features. Now, the advantage of using this L1 classifier is that we usually end up with relatively small number of features that affect the transition probability, 
And those features are exactly the proteins that we think are responsible for activating the gene at this time. So let me show you how this looks like when we apply to the same expression data that I've shown you. So this is what we get. Basically, we get this tree-like structure. And the reason we have a tree, I mean, you can actually connect them. But this is based on the way we explore the space, the, the space thing. But what we have is we have each of these buses represents gene expression. So it's a cluster in the previous slide that I've shown you. But in addition, I have these green nodes, which are annotated with transcription factors. And these are the proteins that we believe control this, uh, 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 control this uh, divergent event. So these two are basically the master regulators. They control the things that go up first. And then there's these guys control the next step. This controls other steps, and so forth. So you basically come up with ways of associating temporal information with static information. And that's actually important, uh, both, both in terms of basic biology, but also for pharmaceutical studies, because you want to know which is basically controlling first, and who comes second, who are the muscles, and who are only the secondary. And you can actually make some good biological story about why this makes sense. As usual in biology, it's much more interesting to people if you can come up with new prediction and then validate them. So we did some uh, additional experiments to validate not the fact that a lot of people validate interactions in networks, so not the fact that this guy controls some of the proteins, but that this guy controls them at a specific time point. And you can do some experiments, and, and these usually validate, or in this case, anything above the diagonal is really high controlled compared to other things. And, and once you have a, something that works, biologists are very good at coming up with stories to explain why it worked. So we also have a story of why we think this is the right thing to do, in this case, for this guy. So we think it involved, it's involved in the recovery process and so on. But, but the important thing in this case, I thought, was the assignment of uh, HMF. And just to, uh, uh, I think, to tell you that biologists are really waiting for these things. They are waiting for these tools. Once we put it out, a lot of people became interested. And this has been applied since to uh, uh, a lot of other. So this was the yeast one I've shown you, but other people applied it to E. coli, to stem cells. Uh, to immune response, and most recently there was a very large effort by the NIH to study fly development. This is a collection of 30 groups uh, spending <laughs> millions of dollars throwing basically all the technologies that people have developed in order to see how flies develop. And they had all this data, some of it was tiny serious, some of it was not, and they were looking basically for a way to put all of this together in you know, this key figure. Basically the last figure in the paper, look at all the data we collected, and here is what we get out of it. And they actually use this method to put all the data together and, and it's our funny development. And so I don't have a, a much more time. I want to mention that we are trying to deal with a number of different questions. Some of them we actually address. So there's some problems here. For example, we don't really say who controls these guys. They seem to control the first split, but you know, who turns these guys on? Nobody turns them on. That's a problem. So it turns out that they are actually turned on by a different layer, which is called the signaling network. Here we looked at the regulatory network. There's another layer called the signaling network that we ignored. And actually, we need to take that into account and combine it with this. And we have some way of doing it, but it's not very clean. It's a combina combination of combinatorial algorithm and a graphical model. And we are working with David Hackerman and a few other people on trying to come up with a full graphical model for that. Um, there are some splits that we cannot explain. So basically, we don't know why this happens. And it turns out that you can do some other types of convolution methods to try and solve those. And there are some other types of regulators that you can have. And so we, found, we came up with a new deconvolution method for this. Um, you can actually revise the constraint, of the constraint optimization problem that I mentioned for the logistic regression classifier in order to solve this. Um, and let me, I'm going to skip a number of applications here and jump directly to some other open problems that we are interested in. Um, one thing we are very interested in, and it's not uh, trivial, is how do we discover combinatorial regulation? So a lot of these events in biology are not a function of one thing that happens. It's the function of a number of things that are working together, but the number of combinations is pretty hard. So the question is, how do we search efficiently the space in order to find a, a combinatorial regulation? A, and I mean, the space here is, could be actually pretty large because the number of possible uh, regulators is pretty large. Um, uh, feedback. Feedback is very important in biology. Um, HMA, of course, doesn't provide for that, at least not the way we uh, developed it. Other graphical models 
not, do not always take that into account. So how do we introduce <coughs> feedback into this temporal uh, dynamic model? That's something that we are very interested in, in finding out. And as I mentioned, uh, can we combine this m model we had for the signaling network, which is based on combinatorial optimization, solving some uh, uh, SAT-related problem with the HMM graphical model into a, one, a complete graphical model, and there the problem has to do with uh, inference and learning, which becomes just a huge challenge and, and takes, you know, it becomes basically impossible to do. Okay, so uh, let me just thank the uh, group that, uh, that has worked on this. So um, the cross-species work was done by Heisen and Marcel. Um, sorry, the RNA-6, the cross-species by Guy and Aaron, and we have a large group that is trying to work on the uh, dynamic networks. Uh, this is implemented in software, and actually uh, you and anybody else can download it and use it. We work with a lot of biological collaborators, and that's very important both to validate the predictions, but also this leads, I think, to very interesting discussions about what to do next, and some of the assumptions that we make turns out to be completely uh, irrelevant to biology, and we need to adjust everything. Uh, and this is a very nice, but uh, a long iterative process. Sometimes um, some students are frustrated because to wait for a biological experiment, especially if you want to finish your PhD, and it depends on, a, <laughs> on some biological experiments that unfortunately don't always come out as planned. That might be frustrating, but when they do, I think it's pretty really exciting. So uh, the software is here, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. In the sequencing process, when you have errors, uh, it sounds like you get you know, a C instead of a G. But are you getting C with this probability? So essentially, at every at every base pair, uh, you obviously have a winner. But um, is there a way to use the, the probability vector of what, what comes out? Yeah. So the question was, um, you know, you get. I, I I presented it as if we just see um, a deterministic value in each location, which is wrong. You're right. There is. Well, you don't, well, that, that depends. Most of the machines, what they give you is a quality score. So they can tell you how confident they are in this specific letter. You, 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 they may or may not be able to output confidence for the other letters, but definitely for the winner, you have this uh, confidence score. So we actually try to use it. Um, first of all, it slows down a bit, the learning part. Second, it didn't seem to improve dramatically. So, of course, this confidence score is based on what the machine thinks, and that's uh, part of why it had the errors in the first place. So, so the, the short answer is this information is there. We haven't used it. Um, it may or may not be that this can help, but it's a nice uh, direction. There's another thing, again, if anybody's interested, there's something called pair end. Actually, you don't get one, you get two, and they come from, there is some space between them. And people are using it in the, so basically you, you extract two together from the genome, and that can be used also for, uh, for correction of, it has, it's been used a lot for the assembly, but also for the correction. We haven't used that, but that's another direction. Yeah. So I was not quite sure how the HMM is able to capture the very large state space, for example, in the fly development application state space is enormous. It's a combinatorial state space, and yet you're modeling it with HGM. I just don't understand how that works. OK, so the question is, you know, how do we model flight development with an HMM where flight development is very long? So the data that we get is, or the time series data that we get, which influences the complexity of the HMM model, is sampled at discrete intervals. So basically, you have maybe, in flight, it depends. But let's say we have 20 times, OK? Now, we assume that a set of genes that starts together can diverge or can stay the same. So basically, we learn this sort of a tree HMM where you can either transition, or you can either transition from one state to only one state, it's only the deterministic transition, or you can transition to two or three, it doesn't matter. You can have a split within that. So in that regard, the HMM, the number of possible states is constrained to two or three to the power of, of time points that you have which is not very large, actually. And in practice, a lot of this stabilizes at some states, so you don't get uh, many more states. So in that case, the number of states in the HMM is actually not that large. Again, depends on the day. If you have continuous data, then it's completely different. But there's no way to measure continuously 
the complete set of at least not now, the complete set of expression for let's say fly or whatever species you're looking at. So yeah, in practice, the, the number of states is actually not that large. Yeah. It's pretty linear usually in the number of time points. But then, what you find from data is essentially forced on it by your assumptions about how the process is working. I mean, you obviously find an answer, but whether it bears a relation to the actual process. Right. So, OK, so let me repeat. So again, the, the question or the next question was, you know, we are very restricted because, because of this model in the set of questions that we can answer. I completely agree. So this HMM can only answer, and again, the way I described it, the extensions can do slightly more, but the, the questions that this can answer is which transcription factor activate genes at specific time points. So given, so I didn't tell you exactly what goes on into it, but the, the HMM gets static data about the transcription factor and a set of possible targets. And the answer is, or the answer that this HMM can tell you is, this transcription factor activates genes after three hours. So it involves in this stage of development. Now this is very important because we have 2,000 different transcription factors. You cannot, you can do time series for RNA seq. You can do gene expression at 20 time points, but you cannot do 20 times 2,000 experiments. That's what people cannot do. But they still really want to know the control diagram for each of these time points. So this narrows the space of possible regulators for each time point. And then you get basically a prediction, and then you have to do the testing. But instead of testing 20 times 2,000, usually you have to test 20 times 5, which is feasible, 20 times 10, for example. So this, way, this is answering just this part of question. Again, we have extensions that can answer other questions related to, for example, what are potential drug candidates and so forth. But it definitely cannot answer, or it doesn't model it doesn't even come close to modeling flight development uh, in general. Yeah, so if that, if that was implied for my talk, then please take it back. Any other questions? We have a couple minutes. I'll just keep firing off. Um, so if you go back to the yeast uh, dynamics, um, it looked to me like every uh, timestamp there was a significant thing happening. I don't know if you have data in between each of the, the change points, um, but I mean, to me, what it looks like is that you may be wanting to try to get some sampling uh, at a much higher time resolution around where you're thinking that the change points are going. So I wonder if you started working on sort of spending time seeing exactly how you get these phase transitions between networks, uh, which I, I probably has brought applicability to you know sort of social networks as well. Um, and then also if you sort of developed a mechanism for uh, kind of interpolating uh, through the time series? Okay, so the question, initial question was about the sampling. It seemed from the images that I've shown, which is actually true, that the sampling rate initially wasn't very good, and then maybe later things converged, so it wasn't that bad. Sampling rate has been something that I've been talking about for almost a decade. It has to do with experimental design, which is another key problem in biology. It's not trivial to convince biologists to do some comprehensive analysis or study about the time series. So when they design an experiment, and again, yeast maybe is slightly easier, so it depend, basically it comes down to money because each of these time points costs money. But if you think about clinical experiments, for example, we have to draw blood, right? It's almost entirely based on their intuition, their knowledge, or whatever. They, now, you can think of ways, and you can discuss this online, to automate this process. And we have some papers even in ICML on how to design sampling rates that will improve. Um, so it's nice theoretical work, but unlike all, almost all of the work that I've shown, I don't have any biology to, to support it because nobody was willing basically to do this. They said, you know, that's the time series. The other thing you asked about was, a, a, so, so I think it's an important problem and which hasn't been addressed yet. Adequately. The other thing is, um, you know, you asked about state transition. Uh, people have been talking about uh, about state transition, not so much in the context of dynamics. They did look at it in the context of change between two different response regimes. So if you are in a, some steady state and some things happen, what's the next steady state that you get to? There's actually a lot of research going into this criticality domain and, and what is a critical phase. And there are some actually very interesting, I mean, that's not something we have worked on, but people have looked into that. And, and, and they have some uh, insights and they claim, and again, that's arguable because the current data is not complete, but they claim that a lot of these biological interaction that will follow this critical uh, 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 
connectivity path pattern, which has actually it has some pretty simple equation that governs it, basically. So people have been looking into it quite a lot uh, over the last decade. The jury is still out whether this is really what's going on. Someone has one brief question, or we change speakers? Otherwise, let's take a speaker.